them. And um, we um, are going to start with a couple of opening reflections. The format is going to be uh, kind of informal. So we'll have open, a, a series of sort of opening reflections from each of our speakers on their research and work. And then I um, and then we will have sort of a free flowing discussion. I'll have a couple of initial questions. And then we will um, take questions from those people who are on the call. I ask, since I will be moderating the questions, can you please uh, down in your chat box, if you have questions, please send them directly to me. And then I will uh, will moderate them for, for the event um, so that we will try to stop the event uh, at exactly one o'clock. All right, so uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Kristen Godsey. I am a professor in the Department of Russian and East European Studies and a member in the graduate group of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. As I said, I'm really delighted to be hosting this event today with our three really wonderful speakers. Um, I'm going to just read very briefly their biographies and then put those bios in the chat if you're interested. Um, Agnieszka Kozianska is the Leverholm Visiting Professor at Oxford School of Global and Area Studies and Associate Professor in the Department of Ethnology and, and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Warsaw. In the past, she was a visiting fellow at Harvard University in 2010 and 2011 at the New School for Social Research and at the University of Copenhagen. Um, and a variety of other really incredible fellowships that she's had. She is the author uh, and co-editor of several volumes on gender and sexuality, including To See a Moose, The History of Polish Sex Education, which is forthcoming with Bergen Books this year. And also um, the book Gender, Pleasure and Violence, The Construction of Expert Knowledge of Sexuality in Poland, which just came out in English. Um, it, with Indiana University Press. And I believe that Alina is going to post a discount code for anybody who is interested in getting that book in the chat. Our second speaker is Katarzyna Liszkova, who is an associate professor in sociology at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. Her research focuses on gender, expertise, sexuality, and the social organization of intimacy, particu particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. She is currently affiliated as a guest researcher in the Department of History and Heart, Art History at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And um, in the spring of 2001, she's a senior fellow at the Descartes Center for History and Philosophy of Science, uh, of the Sciences and the Humanities. Um, she has uh, an incredible uh, other number of other um, affiliations, which I will post in the chat. Um, but her most recent book, which she's going to be talking about today, is called Sexual Liberation, Socialist Style, Communist Czechoslovakia and the Science of Desire from 1945 to 1989, which won the 2019 Barbara Helt Prize for Best Book and received an honorable mention for the 2019 Adele E. Clark Book Award. Uh, her papers have appeared in uh, such journals as Medical History, History of the Human Sciences, History of Psychology, Sexualities, and History of the Family, among others. Paulina Aronson, our third speaker, is a sociologist and a journalist who was born in St. Petersburg, but now lives in Berlin. Paulina has a PhD in sociology from Warwick University in Great Britain. Her main field of interest is sociology of emotions. As a non-academic researcher, Paulina investigates emotional regimes in post-Soviet Russia and publishes in various Russian and international outlets, such as Open Democracy, Aeon, Kulta.ru, um, and others. Her first book, uh, Love, Do It Yourself, DIY, um, How We Turned Into Managers of Our Feelings in Russians, was published in 2020 in Moscow. Paulina also teaches sociology of emotions in various Russian independent educational hubs such as Neon University in Liberty and others. So I am going to put all of these biographies into the chat so that you can get a little bit more information about our speakers. But I'm going to open this forum by, uh, by asking each of our speakers in turn, uh, Agnieszka, Katarzyna, and then Polina, to speak for about five minutes or so about their research and their interest around the topic of love and sex behind the Iron Curtain. So let's start with Agnieszka. Hello. Thank, thanks so much for this wonderful introduction and for, for organizing this event. Uh, this, this 
really a pleasure and honor to be here with everybody. And thanks so much for, thanks everybody for joining us uh, during this lunch, lunch time or afternoon here in Europe. So let me just, just say a few words about, uh, about my research on sexology in Poland, which I presented in this uh, Gender, Pleasure and Violence book. So, so, and so, in in this in this research, I focus mostly on um, liberalization of sexuality in uh, in Poland in the nineteen seventies and the, the proliferation of sexual sexual discourses that happened uh, in Poland in the nineteen seventies. So, for instance, the most popular Polish sex book, Sztuka Kochania, The Art of Loving. You might have seen the film, which was. Uh, made about about the book a few years ago so so the art of loving sold seven million copies in socialist catholic uh poland in the in the late 1970s and it was absolute heat i everybody had it uh, including my parents and i read it when i was a teenager but then when i reread it later on uh in the early 2000s i thought well this book, yes, talks about sexuality, but it's also very problematic in many in many ways because it really talks about gender in a highly traditional way. So it promotes sexuality, it promotes sexual libera liberation, does some kind of sexual revolution, but at the same time talks that women should be women and men should be men. So this is not that easy that sexual liberation goes with gender equality. So the book really complicates this thing. But also when I started to look much deeper at these issues, I saw that certain discourses of traditional gender roles was something that women really wanted because Polish sexology or more broadly Polish sexual expertise was very much uh, based on the dialogue between patients and doctors. And many women who came to see Wiswotska and other Polish sexologists, they were really confused about uh, uh, gender equality and they uh, double burden and so on. So they were looking for some solutions. And this, uh, this kind of patient-oriented model of sexual sexology allow sexologists and other sex therapists to go into dialogue with the patients and build this kind of really interesting intellectual therapeutic model of understanding gender and sexuality which was i think really unique and led later on to incorporation also of more feminist and or queer ideas into uh, into thinking of polish thinking uh, about uh, about sexuality so I think that that's what what's, what was really really interesting under socialism that there were those research methods that they were not based on uh, they were not based on what we could say science not based on experiments but they were really humanistic and oriented towards patients' experiences which were even sometimes very contradictory. So I think that was ten, five minutes already. <laughs> Wonderful. Katarzyna, would you like to pick up there? Absolutely. Thanks for inviting. And uh, yes, my research also is about uh, the Cold War East, about Czechoslovakia. And my book also shows uh, uh, in great detail that the Cold War East had its sexual liberation. In socialist societies, this liberation came from above and was mediated by experts. In my book, I show sexuality through the prism of expert approaches. I talk about disciplines such as sexology, demography, or psychology that were giving advice to people on how to have good intimate lives and also provided expertise to the state. And in this way, these forms of expertise shaped public policies. When we look at Czechoslovakia, we see at least two things. First, that sexuality can be liberated in the absence of social movements. And two, that sexual and gender liberation do not necessarily go hand in hand. Because in Czechoslovakia, we see that gender and liberation in sexuality occurred already in the 1950s. And then in the 1970s, gender retraditionalization occurred. 
And these developments in and of themselves are contrary to what we know very well from the Western narrative uh, of the sexual revolution in the 60s and the 70s. Importantly, I show a socialist country as a modern country. Modernity is not only capitalist. Socialist states in the second half of the 20th century attempted an alternative modernity, which was guided by the ideas of both class and gender equality. We know that in many respects, socialist states failed, that political freedoms, to name just one example, uh, were rather absent. But I claim that we would do ourselves a disservice if we disregarded many social liberties that socialism introduced long before its capitalist rival, especially in the realm of gender and sexuality. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, and our final introductory statement by Polina Aronson. Hello, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Because I have some funny window here. Um, yes, we can hear you, yeah. Um, I think for me, the most important thing that I uh, would like to say from the beginning that the import of the ideas which uh, Agnieszka and Katarzyna have presented uh, into the USSR was very limited. So when we're talking about uh, socialism, it, I think it is really, really important that we distinguish between different kinds of socialism and the kind of things that um, Poland and Czechoslovakia went through, the kind of surge of expert knowledge and um, availability of this expert knowledge to the general population uh, did not quite occur in the Soviet Union. And um, just a little vignette on that front, a story I have told uh, the two, the three other panelists um, on a different occasion, um, a Czech manual about giving birth was translated into Russian um, in the end of 1970s and was very popular among Russian women. This was one of the very few available um, manuals about sexual and maternal health uh, that was out there. And my parents, when my mother was pregnant with me in 1980, uh, my mom and my dad would read it to each other loudly, mostly for the comic relief, because none of the realities which this book was describing uh, had anything to do with the life uh, of uh, two um, educated, uh, what you could call middle-class Soviet uh, people in Leningrad. And uh, the chapter which caused most uh, giggles was a list of things that was meant to be taken to the hospital, uh, such as, for example, a breastfeeding bra. My mother never heard of breastfeeding bras, let alone seeing them or being able to take them to the hospital. Um, on top of that, of course, you couldn't take anything to the uh, Russian maternity hospital. That wouldn't be possible. So everything would be just taken away from you. So the Czech realities translated into the Russian uh, language just did not apply. And I think this is a this is a rather sad and rather you know important point that a lot of uh, Russian gender uh, researchers make. My colleagues. Um, who do research in sex education and women's health, they continuously talk about a uh, very poor state of sexual education uh, in the Soviet Union, a lack of contraceptives, uh, and as a result, extremely high uh, number of per capita abortions among Soviet women. Some researchers um, claim a figure between four to five abortions uh, per woman. I mean, this is a very, very high figure. Uh, this is not an experience any of us probably would like to make in, in their lives. So um, I fully agree with uh, general statements about socialism being able to emancipate women in a very different way that capitalism does. But I would also be very cautious about extrapolating results of uh, your research, Agnieszka, uh, Kirsten and Katarzyna, to the Russian realities. Thank you. Wonderful. So I think that that's a great place for us to start our uh, discussion. I went, you know, in a, a previous iteration of this conversation, which we've had with each other uh, over the last couple of weeks, um, we were talking a lot about the differences, uh, not only differences in things like uh, access to sex education, but also access to 
reproductive rights at different periods of time. Um, I bring to this, uh, you know, knowledge of both the Bulgarian case and also the East German case. And I think that one of the things that we really need to highlight, as Paulina said, is the diversity and um, the diversity of the of the of the situation in Eastern Europe is reflective of the diversity of the different types of, of socialism, right? That that was um, present at different periods of time, um, and also among the different countries. So, can you each perhaps talk a little bit about maybe what was unique in um, the Polish case? Uh, especially since Poland, Poland was Catholic, right? And it had these reproductive freedoms, which um, they don't anymore, right? The, the current government is trying to roll those back. Also, Katarzyna, you know, can you talk a little bit about what was unique perhaps about the Czechoslovak case and what has happened um, after 89? And then Polina, I think for you, I'd love you to talk a little bit about how women's emancipation in the Soviet context didn't necessarily have this sexual aspect to it. That, that why not? Why wasn't there a kind of attention to sex education um, and birth control as there were in places like the GDR, for instance, where, you know, uh, oral contraception use was actually quite prevalent, right? Um, so uh, Agnieszka, why don't you start? What was unique to Poland? Yes, definitely Poland is, uh, is uh, the, the most uh, religious place of uh, all the places we are talking about. And the Catholic Church was really strong in the 1970s. But this book I was talking about, which sold 7 million copies, was published in the 1970s, just around the time Karol Wojtyła became the Pope. And it was like a book talking about birth control, sexual position, 20 pages on female orgasm. And so that was really a very revolutionary book for that time. And then, as you mentioned, abortion abortion was uh, was legalized in Poland uh, already in 56. And, and Poland gave, I think, the most unlimited uh, abortion, access to abortion in comparison to all the countries we are talking about. It was more liberal than in Czechoslovakia or in uh, in Bulgaria because it was just for the, most of the time on demand. So so I think the, those are the things. And, and then when we, when, I, when we talk about the expertise itself, I think Polish sexology is also very unique in its humanistic take. And this is really important because now we talk about a lot from a feminist perspective. We talk a lot about uh, uh, sexuality being uh, over biomedicalized or over commercialized or commodified. And then what Polish sexologists did in the 1970s and 80s, they were talking about sexuality in this very humanistic and intersectional way. So, so the concept of intersectionality uh, in talking about uh, sexuality, which we connect with how we talk, think about sexuality today, it was already there in the 1970s. It wasn't that complex as this is to, uh, today, but, but at the same time, it was also very much, uh, sexuality was really seen in its social context. And so it doesn't matter the technique is not important if you are poor and you you don't have money to feed your children and you you have your husband who beats you then no technique will help you to achieve an orgasm if this is this is the the case so so i think that that, that this looking at sexuality through social lens was a really uh, really unique when it comes to to polish expertise not to mention a lot of quite progressive things given the catholic context thank yeah. you yeah yeah, I'm always surprised at, you know, the, this sort of interesting, li you know, liberatory discourses around sexuality in Poland compared to the Catholic context, especially given what's happened, you know, since 1990. Katarzyna. Yes, if I were to name one thing that was special for the Czechoslovak context, that would be a strong expertise in sexuality, which began already after World War II in 1945 and continued uninterruptedly throughout the entire state socialist period because many disciplines that have to deal with human life, such as sociology, uh, psychology, philosophy, all those disciplines got discontinued some repeatedly. And uh, sexology is an exception to this rule because sexology was a medical discipline and sexologists had their strong allies and other medical doctors. And the center, Sexological Institute in Prague, really functioned from 1945 and functions till this day 
without an interruption. So in Czechoslovakia, we can look at what these people did, what they researched and what conclusions they reached and how they changed over time. And we can make sense of their research and findings and recommendations in the context of the changing accents of the regime. That is one thing. And the one concrete example of uh, uniqueness of Czechoslovak sexological research would be its continued research into the female orgasm, which began already in the early 1950s. The first research uh, which had the female orgasm at its focus was published already in 1952. And uh, then sexologists found out that women who were not experiencing orgasm and who were not enjoying their sex lives were those who were not in loving equal marriages. By the end of that decade, sexologists organized a conference that was specifically devoted to the female orgasm and the recommendations that were discussed there would sound really, I dare say, feminist to our current ear when experts were recommending that men participate more in household uh, jobs and with child rearing and that would bring orgasm to women. So they were not at that point yet focusing on sexual technique that came only later in the 70s, but they were saying that what needed to change were gender roles, was the, the equality between the spouses and uh, their loving relationship. Of course, that was all underscored by women's continued participation in the labor force, which the experts understood was what gave them uh, the self worth and, and uh, the self understanding worthy of a socialist woman. Wonderful, thank you so much. Yeah, Polina, would you like to jump in there and respond? Sure. So, uh, as uh, if I understood correctly, you would like me to focus a little bit more on how uh, the specific type of uh, Soviet uh, feminism and why, for some reason, uh, sexual liberation has not become a part of it. I think that uh, it's not quite fair to say that uh, sexual liberation has never been a part of the Soviet um, emancipatory project. As we all know, in the 1920s, it was a very big thing, and Alexandra Kollontai has really paved way for what we could uh, probably uh, call polyamory or a relationship anarchy, some people call it today. So in that, in that sense, you know, for some time, unexpectedly, Russia has become a laboratory for all sorts of sexual experiments in the 1920s. But uh, in the 1930s, all that has uh, collapsed and uh, an idea of uh, a nuclear reproductive pronatal family has been consolidated uh, throughout the Stalin years. That was pretty clear because you needed people to be predictable. You needed people to live in predictable items and to reproduce labor force, to reproduce soldiers, and you didn't want any sexual experiments. And uh, the attacks on the old Bolsheviks, the attacks on people who have actually, you know, given the impetus uh, to the uh, to Soviet socialism have also coincided or were apart on uh, the, the, uh, the attacks on sexual liberties that these people actually were promoting have become a part of the general political climate uh, in the country. And uh, for a long time, for several decades, this uh, idea of consolidated family of the Soviet marriage as being at the center of uh, everything and uh, um, being very patriarchal has remained in place. And I think that in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, you know, this started to change. I mean, obviously, the, it, was, it has also been very much related with the um, abortion legislation. We didn't have uh, abortions uh, legal between the middle of 1930s till the end of the 1950s. And then uh, all these liberties were gradually starting to come back. And yet uh, what became kind of the alternative to the story of a perfect Soviet marriage, which had to be uh, based on duty and not on some frivolous feelings, was actually the idea of romantic love. So with, where you guys had your sexual liberation, we had our narrative about romantic feelings. Uh, we had our ideas of falling in love wildly and uh, where the GDR had sex and the wild beaches, Soviet people had dreams about uh, running away with somebody they loved. So it was a lot more based on emotions. We see it in the Soviet cinematic narratives really a lot. I mean, if we look at the late Soviet uh, cinema, if we look at the um, late 
Soviet uh, novels, we see a lot of these stories, a lot of these narratives, how this uh, runaway into feelings, into uh, an affair, perhaps, becomes a legitimate way of, uh, you could call it dissidency, but it wasn't thought as such, but it was a way of carving a space. It's a kind of an emotional refuge from the Soviet power and love was giving it, uh, not sex. Everything that was related to sex uh, still remained very much under the um, control of people who believed that sex had to be tamed, sex had to be at the service of a marriage, and there was no place for any kind of experiments in that place. And of course, there were exceptions like uh, Igor Kong, um, but in general, the discourse was about educating the youth to behave properly while you could have very wild feelings and um, the kind of, uh, I think that the kind of emotional freedom uh, that the late socialism offered is also very different from the emotional freedom that uh, we encounter in the new liberal world. Can you elaborate on that last point just for a sure, second? Sure, just don't want because... to take too much time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I, if I would summarize it, I think that, um, Obviously, uh, a Soviet subject, the Soviet individual, uh, had very limited uh, scope of genres in which uh, they could participate as lovers. You know, uh, homosexual love was not um, recognized. Uh, marriage was required. Uh, you know, if you were dating somebody, you were you would be expected to get married quite soon. So the you know the scope of possible opportunities was very limited. But the scope of feelings that you could feel was very, very broad. And I think what's very important is that uh, emotional pain was recognized as something very natural, something that a human being uh, necessarily has, and that failures and failure to understand yourself, uh, not only other people, but your own self, is a very normal human condition. And I think if we look at the new liberal uh, self, uh, in its engagement uh, in love affairs or sexual affairs, we have a very broad scope of possibilities of what you can engage, what you can do, you know, it's, everything is possible, you know, uh, homosexual, heterosexual, cisgender, non-binary, uh, non anything is possible. Uh, polyamorous, uh, uh, relationship anarchy, you name it. Uh, while in my opinion, it's a very, at the same time, we have a very narrow scope of emotions that one can feel and a very limited understanding of the subject. So you're, you are not supposed uh, to feel pain. You are not supposed to have relationship failures because if you have them, that means that you, you are not a complete individual. That means that you haven't really fully understood what your needs are. You don't know how to invest into relationships properly and you don't understand how to gain profit from them. So uh, it's, it's an interesting paradox. Um, and we have different kinds of limitations and uh, um, non-liberties in both uh, settings. Thank you. So I'm gonna like throw that question now to Agnieszka and Katarzyna and just ask, you know, one of the things that's really interesting uh, in obviously in the uh, Bulgarian context as well as in the East German context is the sort of um, linking of love and sexuality, right? That like love is, is meant to be, sexuality is meant to be this way of expressing love. Um, and as I think um, Agnieszka said earlier, these were, you know, very pro, they were still very pro-natalist um, regimes, right, that wanted people to have, get married and have families and have children and um, sort of accept their role in society in this particular sort of way. But I am really curious, you know, one of the things that comes out of the research on the GDR is that the, the, the regime itself really felt that sort of a liberated sexuality and these sort of, you know, more authentic sort of human relationships between men and women in particular, um, but maybe more broadly in society, right? This uh, more acceptance of a wider range of human emotions. I think Agnieszka was saying that sexology was much more humanistic in Poland, right? It wasn't just about um, a particular sort of technique or function. It was much more about emotions and society and your role. So can you talk a little bit about, um, first Agnieszka, then Katarzyna, about the role of love and emotions um, and how they relate to um, discourses about sexuality and the family? 
Well, definitely the love was was very important. It's not that Polish people were only encouraged to to have sex. That love was and and especially for girls, it was it was very much that that you should really manage boys' uh, sexual desires and you should you should. This is I think there's a long Polish tradition of of putting women in the position of managing men's sexuality, feelings and health and the family. And I think it was repeated with, under socialism that there were girls who should manage men's sexuality and also men's uh, feelings, that they should, they should make them love to love them. So the two things, sexuality and love, they went together. But of course, I, like in Polina's uh, uh, context, a Russian context, that there was some kind of, uh, you know, dissidence in who you can love. And, and I think that that's not, not so unique uh, to, to Russia, that it was also, it was also here that you can, uh, you could talk about, about feelings and, uh, but yeah, but, but of course these feelings were very much related to, uh, to, to marriage and managing, managing marriage. Oh, you are muted, Kristen. Sorry, Katarzyna, sorry. <laughs> yes, um, love actually is very interesting in sexological discourses in Czechoslovakia because at the very beginning of the regime in the 1950s, love really features dominantly because that's love that people are supposed to be married for, right? No other reason, no for money or because they wanted to leave the parents home, no, love. And people would meet uh, as equal partners and loving each other. That was the ideal that was promoted in sexological manuals that were published for uh, marital partners in the 1950s. That was the idea. And then strangely, by the 1970s, love disappears. Some sexologists are saying, oh, love, just, you know, let go of these ideas. It's just impractical. Uh, marriage is he not here for love, but it's here for bringing up children. So get disciplined. That's essentially what they, what the, the, one of the most uh, famous authors of marriage manuals, Miloslav Plza, kept repeating over and over and over. And it is discursively, it's also interesting that at the same time in the 70s and 80s, sexologists don't even use the term of love when they're talking about how it wasn't there. They, they use the uh, very convoluted expression such as emotional estrangement. And, and they had many, many synonyms for that. So love really disappears from sexological discourses uh, in the late socialism. Oops, okay, I have, I'm getting a ton of questions here in the chat. Um, and so I'm going to um, try to comp compact some of them together um, and have you each um, respond. So. Uh, one set of questions is about same-sex relationships, right? So one person who is coming from Mongolia, um, also a post-socialist country, was interested in the notion of shame around sexuality, but particularly same-sex same sex, um, sexuality, and how um, this question of sh shame and same-sex relationships were dealt with in each of your uh, contexts. Um, another uh, question, uh, that there are two of these that are related. One of them is about the impact on marriage and sexual life of housing conditions. So one of the things that we know is that people, you know, didn't always have uh, very large places to live. Um, and there's a very specific question from a, a graduate student at Penn uh, um, in the Russian context um, in Leningrad about the komunalki um, and how... Um, uh, the the you know the collective form of living did this um, continue friction with others um, or did incite uh, you know different kinds of sexual experiences in the Komunalki before um, during the Soviet period versus afterwards uh, and so let's start with these two related sets so one is about uh, housing housing shortages um, and their impact on uh, sexual life. Um, and the second is about the situation of same-sex um, desires. So let's um, start with uh, Agnieszka. Well, I think that sex education and sexological books are full of appeals to, 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 the, to the party that we need more apartments because people don't have privacy for, for sex. 
So I think that this issue is being that it comes back all the time. But when it comes to to same sex relations, I think this this is a really interesting thing because on the one hand, it it often appears and and then just to add that Holland decriminalized homosexuality already in the 1930s, so even before socialism. But but sometimes it appears as a as a part as it's being put in the context of something being not normal. But then if you have a look at the, this, at this hum, from this humanistic perspective, how homosexuality is being dis discussed in the letters and in, in replies to these letters, there, there's, there's really a big uh, liberalization in attitudes towards homosexuality in the 1970s. So in the beginning of the 1970s, uh, if you read the sex column, a sex column by, by Zbigniew Lewstanowicz, who's the major Polish sex uh, sex expert, he was the still is and was there in the 70s. So in the early 1970s, he quotes only letters that saying, "Well, I'm a homosexual, and it's the the, the biggest tragedy that happened to me." And in the reply to these letters, he saying, "Well." He, he just refer, he, he discusses all sorts of research about sexuality, uh, about homosexuality, like for instance, Kinsey's research, saying, well, that homosexuality is so common and it's really quite normal. And there are those places when there, when there, uh, there are uh, profi profile cafes and, uh, and profile spaces for homosexuals and so on. But at the end, he says, well, but treatment is possible. So, so he backs up. But then in the late 70s, he talks about, you know, he quotes letters of people demanding rights for homosexuals. And he would say, yeah, I, I agree, homosexuals should have rights. And so I think that, that when it comes to homosexuality, we usually think about uh, uh, sex, uh, sexual rights and activism as something that appeared in Poland either in the 1990s or in the late uh, late 80s but if you have a look at, at sex columns and how they changed in the 1970s this is this is really the the, the space where first homosexual where homosexual desire was really discussed and it was it it was and there there were some really serious rights uh, demanded there so so i think it's a, it's a really big space to study further on thank you uh, Katarzyna, do you want to jump in here on that? Yes, absolutely. So I'll start with homosexuality and then go to housing. Okay. Uh, Czechoslovak uh, sexologists had really a lot to do with decriminalization of homosexuality, which occurred in Czechoslovakia in 1961. And the, there was the in the 50s a big research experiment uh, run by sexologist Kurt Freund. Uh, which was based on behaviorist principles and Kurt Freund and his sexological co-workers were trying to see if they can re-educate, re-teach men to feel different, to behave differently uh, in terms of uh, their sexual desires. And after eight years, they essentially came to the conclusion that it is not possible to change the object of desire and man's behavior. And because it is not possible to treat uh, true to four medical doctors said, if we can change it, we cannot keep punishing these people for something that, that is within their, without their, their powers to change. So uh, they pushed for the decriminalization uh, of homosexuality and that occurred. And uh, from then on, Czechoslovak sexologists were very friendly to homosexuality. They did not see it as some perversion, but as just a variant form of uh, human sexuality. Um, in the broader public, though, uh, words such as homosexuals were not very much used, and there was rather silence, and I think that was very similar in other socialist countries, that publicly there was no um, movement and visibility, at least until the late 80s. But that uh, silence also gave some possibilities to, to people just to live their lives however quietly. And at least for Czechoslovakia, there are no documented cases of some uh, wide persecutions of homosexuals that were documented for other countries. Uh, so as far as I know, there was, uh, there was the case in Czechoslovakia. As to housing, again, the situation very similar as in other socialist countries. For the longest time after the war had ended, there was a lack of housing. And in the early 60s, there was still about 
uh, 12, 13 percent of newly married couples who had their own housing. Typically, young people after marriage, they would still with, uh, live with one of the parents of the, either the husband or the wife, which, as you can imagine, was not particularly helpful for their marriage. And um, many things were being rethought regarding marriage and the family in the 60s by experts. And housing was one of those things. And when the 70s came, uh, multiple packages were introduced to strengthen the family, including the boost in housing. So all these new panel houses uh, were being built precisely with the aim to give this privacy and space to young people who would get married and have children. And privacy was a word that was very often repeated also in sexological research in the 70s and on. Yeah, and I would just add that I, I think in the GDR context as well, there was a real push uh, to create a lot more socialist housing precisely because they were trying to get uh, the creation of more nuclear families um, and 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 create the conditions for privacy and you know intimacy. Paulina, would you like to jump in there? I fear I'm really not an expert on both topics, so I will be very brief. Um, as for the homosexuality um, question, I think that um, the best uh, source known to me, at least on those uh, issues, are um, publications by Irina Raldugina, who is writing extensively about that. And uh, just to answer this question very briefly, I will refer to, um, to her works, where um, she suggests that the discourse of, some, of uh, homosexuality as being something totally uh, unlegitimate and also criminalization of homosexuality is very much related to the Gulag tradition or the, the practices of, uh, of group male rape in Gulag. Um, so in the, in the 1920s, as uh, Raldugina suggests, uh, the homosexual culture, the homosexual life, at least for males, uh, was rather present in big cities like Odessa and Leningrad and uh, uh, Petrograd back then and Moscow. And uh, with the beginning of the 1930s, due to the kind of general change of climate towards sexuality and consolidation of all ideas and sexuality around reproductive family, homosexuality has become something that should not be spoken about. At first, it has just become off the radar. Then it was criminalized. And uh, many decades of uh, gulag realities has turned homosexuality into something that is uh, only you know, pertinent to men with criminal legacy. So I won't say uh, more because uh, I'm afraid I can only speak in cliches here. As for the housing policies, well, we all know that um, uh, Khrushchev has carried out this major uh, housing reform and it's uh, due to uh, efforts of his government that a lot of people in Russia are still living in the so-called so -called Khrushchevkas. Uh, yet again, I'm really not an expert to speak about that. I don't know uh, how strong the discourse of sexuality was related to housing discourse, but I will just give you one funny, uh, again, comic relief uh, thing. Uh, one of the very first issues of Cosmopolitan, uh, when it came out in Russia, I think in 1994, uh, was about having sex in Komunalka. I was just trying to Google up this article. I didn't, uh, I, I couldn't find it, but I, I found an interview with the first editor-in-chief of the Cosmopolitan where she reflects on this experience because when they joined forces, when the um, American um, publisher has uh, started a franchise uh, in Russia and they you know, founded the editorial board, um, they had no idea what to write about. How, where do we start? So one of the first uh, conversations to the readers was about how do you have sex in Khrushchevka in one of those um, so-called prakhadnaya komnata, you know, a room uh, where people go through. It's a, it's, a, it's a part of every, like very many, many Khrushchev apartments. Um, yes, and the, a manual on how to do it in the Komunalka. If I, if I manage to Google it up by the end of our conversation, I'll put it in the chat. Great. Okay. We have a question very specifically about violence and uh, both um, the way that uh, expert discourse may have dealt with or ignored 
um, in each context, uh, consensual violence in sex, so BDSM, um, as well as non-consensual violence, such as uh, you know domestic violence in the home or rape. I know Agnieszka, you've written about this um, in your book. Can you speak, uh, and then we'll we'll go around very quickly. There are a couple more great questions, so I hope we have time for them all. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Janet, for for this question. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, when it comes to 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 things like BDSM, there there, there were some discussions whether it, 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 you can de define it as normal or not. If both people agree, and and the sexologists dis discuss, and some some agree that it's normal, some others say, well, no, not really. But when it comes to sexual violence and rape, so. Here again, Poland has an extremely progressive law with with like really strong, uh, really broad understanding of uh, uh, of sexual violence. So you could you could so things like like marital rape were pr prosecuted in Poland already in the 1930s, and it, and the law which was under socialism also allowed this. There were, it's not that there were a lot of cases like this. But but it, legally it was possible to 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 prosecute to to be you know punished for marital rape or homosexual rape. So this this are this were really progressive uh, thinking. So this was really progressive thinking, especially if you compare to other European, the Western European countries that really define rape really narrowly and also uh, or I don't know didn't really think about things like marital rape. But at the same time, if you look at, at discourses that surrounded sexual violence, there were a lot of stereotypical thinking about women being responsible for uh, for violence because they're supposed to be in charge of men's sexual desire. So, and that's why the, the responsibility was theirs. But then again, because of this really uh, broad humanistic horizons of, of experts, like sexologists, when feminists appear, they were quite open to to uh, to shifting this narrative and being more uh, feminist when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, sexual violence. Yeah, so that's in short. Katarzyna, go ahead. Yeah, th there was something strange that happened in Czechoslovakia in the 70s. So that's in Czechoslovakia, the period of gender retraditionalization and the focus on the family. And at that point in time, sexologists started to medicalize men who behave violently towards women. So those men were in front of the court, but they were not sentenced as, say, rapists, but were sent to sexological care in the newly established sexological wards in psychiatric hospitals as sexual delinquents. They were heterosexual, so no homosexual men being punished here. That's not what it's all about. These are heterosexual men who behave in a weird way, who act out, and sexologists talk about these men as lacking in the, in the courtship capabilities. They don't know how to approach a woman, how to build a relationship. They have lack of sexual knowledge. They don't know how to um, have fun conversation with a woman. So this is what they begin to focus on in these sexological works to try to teach these men how to treat a woman. And, and they go to such lengths as to organize dances in these psychiatric hospitals with female patients who were in the female wards because they were just trying to build this domesticity in these men. And at the same time, uh, criminologists are, as forensic experts in courts, attesting to murders of wives as not as dangerous as other types of murderers because they are acting under emotional distress and this emotionality effectively feminizes them and makes them less dangerous in the eyes of criminologists to the society because they, their violent act occurs in the private, which further attests to the sharp divide that was introduced in late uh, socialism in Czechoslovakia between the private and the public. And for this criminological research, I would like to give a shout out to my doctoral student, Lucia Moravanska. 
Sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Paulina, did you want to um, jump in here real quick and talk a little bit about um, housing? And you said um, a few other uh, points that you wanted to make. I just wanted to say a few words about um, housing. I just realized that, um, um, interestingly enough, probably the most widely read and one of the most influential novels of the late Soviet period was uh, a novel by Yuri Trifonov called Admian, or The Exchange. Uh, and it's a story of uh, a Moscow family, um, which is trying to exchange uh, their small apartment for a bigger apartment. And uh, it's a metaphor, this whole novel is a metaphor of um, an emotional life um, of a person in, in late socialism. And it's a moral tale, obviously. And it's a moral tale um, of somebody uh, who is... Um, trying to treat emotions as commodities. And this is a very interesting thing because when we talk about uh, Soviet Union, often we speak about uh, emotional socialism and it's probably, it, it's an interesting notion that my colleague Yulia Lerna is working on. So just like we have emotional capitalism, uh, Eva Luz is extensively writing about as well as other sociologists, you could possibly also speak about uh, emotional socialism, but emotional socialism doesn't necessarily have to be fully antagonistic to emotional capitalism. And uh, be, uh, due to novels like Trifonov, due to, you know, if, we, if you dig into the meaning of these novels, if you dig into the uh, Soviet films um, of the 1970s and 1980s, we also see this tendency to commodify emotions and to treat them as, as products, as something that can be exchanged, something that can be invested, and the tale of this apartment is a tale of somebody who is aspiring to personal happiness. It's a story of uh, a person who actually considers personal hedonism to be an important value, which has never been regarded as such in the Soviet Union. And Trifonov is treating, you know, he's looking at it also. He's also thinking that this is demoralizing, that personal hedonism cannot be achieved unless you really abuse other people, uh, but his opinion aside, it's um, I think it's it's a very good snippet of um, how you know how space, including housing space, becomes a metaphor of of emotional space. What can you do? Where can you do it? With who can you live your emotions? Uh, who is a part of, of your emotional world, etc. Excellent. Okay. Um, there are so many questions. I'm going to, um, it's sort of hard for me to figure out how to get these all in in the last few minutes. But um, one is a very specific uh, question about, uh, Polina, you mentioned the uh, high per capita rate of abortion in the Soviet context. And so there's a question specifically about if you know in the Czechoslovak and Polish context, what the average abortion rate was. And uh, what other forms of birth control were being used um, if it wasn't, if women weren't primarily relying on abortion, even though it was quite liberal. Um, then there's another question about uh, a sort of more historical question. Um, is it significant that Russia never had a renaissance but was wrested from medievalism in the 18th century by Peter the Great? The Polish-Lithuanian Empire during the Renaissance, by contrast, was the most enlightened country in Europe. I've always seen Poland and Czechoslovakia as incomparably more liberal than Russia and the USSR, and I see little change today. So the question is, do you agree that the discrepancy between these two countries and Russia um, is, is, you know, with regard to gender equality, LGBTQ rights, female agency, and individualism can have some sort of historical uh, rootedness? Um, so I'll, 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 we'll just go around one more time. Agnieszka? Yeah, well, to the, to the last one, I think that there's a strong, uh, in, in Poland, and I think more broadly in, in Central Europe, there's a strong distrust towards Russia and that this view of Russia as being uh, as lacking civilization and being something to backward and, and so on. So I think in many ways, there, there always will be, will be Polish, I mean, Polish social movements or Polish intellectuals who will, in various ways, try to distinguish themselves from Russia. So then progressive, progressive intellectuals will, you know, promote ideas that showing that Poland is more progressive than Russia. So I think, I think there's a strong sort of colonial sort of relation here uh, between, between Central Europe and Russia, and uh, that, that's in that it's always there 
in, in the background. And briefly on birth control, Poland also had a really, really high uh, rate of abortion. The, it's being estimated because some abortions were done privately, although it could be done for free in a hospital, but some, some, some women would, would choose to, to see a private doctor and these abortions were not counted. But the, it's being as, uh, estimated that it was even 400 or more abortion annually in Poland, being 38 million country. Uh, so, so there are quite, uh, quite, quite a few. But of course, there were some other means of, of birth control available, such as the pill. Or um, there was a lot of promotion, of course, of so-called natural family planning because Poland, being Catholic, <laughs> this was always there as well. Um, yes, so I have to finish, I guess, now. Katarzyna? Just briefly on abortion. It was uh, fairly often used and the, the numbers of abortion usage rose as it was legalized in uh, 1957. Uh, but until 1986, women in Czechoslovakia had to go in front of a uh, abortion commission. Those were leftovers from the previous arrangement when legally only medical grounds were sufficient grounds for abortion. Or when abortion opened only also for social reasons, those medical commissions stayed in place and later transformed so that they also included uh, lay people, lay women. So there was this barrier in place always, but at the same time, uh, the, these commissions had a 90-95% approval rate. So if the woman braved to go in front of the commission, she uh, highly likely got it. And those were abolished in 1986. Uh, but uh, they, they were very often used, but the, at the same time, medical doctors, gynecologists were very reluctant in prescribing modern forms, so-called modern forms of contraception, especially to young women, especially to women who hadn't given birth yet. And in the late socialism, the most uh, often used form of modern form of contraception was an intrauterine device. And uh, I, when I was thinking why that was, I came up with, uh, with an explanation, it's probably because the failure of intrauterine device, which has to be inserted by a medical specialist, so there is a record that it had been inserted. So the failure of this IUD uh, made the abortion on medical grounds possible for the woman, so she would subvert the commissions. So that was the most often used uh, form of for contraception of, of the modern kind. Uh, but generally, the usage of modern contraception was rather low in Czechoslovakia. And finally, Paulina, do you want to jump in here? Um, I can only repeat what I have said before, that um, unfortunately abortion uh, was the main method of contraception, if you could call it this way, for uh, many Soviet women. And there are actually discrepancies in numbers. Uh, there is no agreement about how many per capita um, there were, so the numbers that my colleague Anna Tjomkina has given me um, is between four and five per person, and I see here in the chat that some other people are citing like six to seven. Um, it's a lot, you know, no matter how you turn it around, uh, you will have a lot, and yes, I've also seen the information about up to 12 abortions uh, per person as a maximum. Um, Intrauteral devices also quite popular in, in the USSR. Um, if you could call anything popular, I mean, uh, most people live without any means of contraceptions. And uh, another, uh, the means of contraceptions which were actually recommended and widely spoken about were, uh, for women were um, um, mostly postcoital contraception methods. And Michelle Rifkin Fish is writing about that. And, um, you know, when we're talking about sexual pleasure, uh, then, you know, you can see that those things just don't, they, they just, the puzzle just doesn't come together. You know, if you have to plan the timing for the intercourse and you have to have a tampon soaked in a special, uh, you know, in special liquid prepared ahead and you are the sole person responsible for carrying out all these uh, um, activities because men, uh, men didn't consider themselves responsible for any contraceptive uh, activities, it does make sex a lot less pleasurable. Uh, as the only non-academic in this panel and the clown of the evening, I'm going to tell you another comic relief story. So uh, <laughs> a family legend, um, 
my mother was staying with me alone when I was probably one year old, while my father was sent for the, to dig potatoes in the fields around Leningrad. And uh, while we were uh, sitting together in the apartment in Leningrad, my mother managed to cut her finger really, really badly. Uh, it was late at night, she couldn't run to a drugstore and she didn't happen to have uh, um, anything to bind it. So the only thing that she managed to have to find somewhere in the household was a condom. And it was so valuable. It was so valuable. They only had one for the next 12 months that she had no choice but to unpack it and you know put a bit of cotton wool inside. And then she wrote my father a letter explaining what happened to the condom and why she had to use it and bringing her very sincere apologies because she knew it will be impossible to get another one anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That's a, a nice uh, way to close out this panel. So I really want to thank all three of you for agreeing to do this panel, for you know Skyping in from Europe, uh, where it's definitely later, and for sharing your research. For those of you on the call, thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, I apologize if I couldn't get to all the questions that were in the chat. Um, I did put some links so that you could find the work uh, and websites of each of the speakers today um, if, in the chat. So if you're interested, I also really want to encourage you to check out their books, um, The Gender, uh, Pleasure and Violence from Indiana University Press, the book um, uh, Sexual Revolution Socialist Style, uh, with Cambridge University Press, and then Love DIY, which I believe is in Russian, right? Is that correct, Paulina? Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, please, you know, uh, avail yourself of their scholarship. They all have, they are all very accomplished writers, and uh, they also have many articles. And, you know, uh, if you're interested in, in these topics, you know, be, please also feel free to uh, reach out uh, as well to them and share their research. So um, I wanna just thank everyone. I'm really thrilled. We, we had about a hundred people on this call. Uh, so that's a really great turnout for lunchtime in Philadelphia during the pandemic. So thank you uh, and uh, have a wonderful uh, e rest of the evening, afternoon, <laughs> whatever is uh, happening there. We're getting a lot of really lovely comments uh, thanking all of you uh, for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us, your expert knowledge with us this afternoon. Thank you so much and many thanks to the audience. It was great to see all the friends uh, in the audience. Thank you for inviting us. This is fun. Yeah, this is, it's, yeah. It's, it's really a lovely opportunity to get together, you know, over the, the, over the Atlantic. Um, and a and chance to wear a dress. When do I wear a dress these days? <laughs> <laughs> But we should now all go and have a, we are already in a, having a beer or wine time. Yeah, you're <laughs> in, home, in Europe. At home. <laughs> at home. So cheers, everybody. Cheers. cheers. Yeah. I have my coffee. So yeah, <laughs> I, I will cheers you with my coffee. I, I still have to grade some papers. <laughs> well, it's St. Right. Patrick's Day. So. Oh, it's St. Patrick's Day. Patrick's That's Day. right. Yeah. Happy St. Patrick's Day. That's right. Everybody should be drinking green beer. Um, Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.